Well, good morning, everyone. Praise God. I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you guys are joining us online today. And uh, we'll get into the word. Uh, just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, if you're a guest with us today in the, in, in the house, or if you're a guest with us maybe online, and if you're a guest with us online, that means that you either uh, stumbled across our website or somebody that loves you a whole lot told you to go watch uh, the City Gate service. So that means that they love you. You got a true friend uh, when they told you that. So uh, we welcome you. And if you're a, a regular attender and you've been gone for a couple of, couple of weeks or a little while, um, let me just tell you where we're at. We're in a series called uh, A Life of Honor. Uh, and it's an it's a important series. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes I struggle uh, in communicating the, uh, the importance or the, the magnitude of a, of a message, of a series. Some are, are more than others. And, and I think this is the one that I just feel a, a great weight on uh, because of the importance of, of, living, of living a life of honor. I feel a responsibility uh, as a pastor uh, to share, share these different things. And when I tell you that, I'm not trying to evoke any kind of sympathy or, oh, poor Pastor Rich, he has such a burden. He, he's struggling. Lord, help him. You can always pray for me. That's, that's okay. But uh, I'm not trying to get any sympathy. But, but I do recognize that I have a responsibility as a sower of the word. Amen. I have a responsibility as a pastor, as a sower of the word of God. And, uh, and that means that I, I study and I pray. And uh, as a part of that, of course, and, and asking the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice uh, just about every Sunday when I pray, um, it's not a, just a routine prayer. I pray God give us grace deposits from the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and, and I don't say in here as much when I pray in my office, uh, Lord, uh, give me boldness to say the things that I need to say and uh, a filter to say the things that I, or not to say the things that I shouldn't say. And sometimes I step over that line anyway. And it usually gets me in trouble. But, uh, you know, there's, we have examples in the word of God in Ephesians uh, chapter six, verse 19 and Romans chapter 15, verse 30, where Paul invokes the prayers of the church to pray for him. There in Ephesians, he's asking them to pray uh, for boldness that he would have boldness to proclaim the word of God. And then uh, in um, then the, the, the uh, scripture in Romans, uh, he's asking the church to strive together with him, to pull along together with him. And we're all in this together, aren't we? It's not, you know, Pastor Rich, it's we're all in this. We're all co-laborers together in this. Because in saying all of that, you recognize today that you have a responsibility as well, don't you? Is that right? You have a responsibility um, and your responsibility is to prepare your soil. If I'm the sower of the word today, you are the soil and you have a responsibility today to come in with a prepared heart, a heart that's ready to receive a good, healthy heart. Uh, your spirit is, 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 is eager to receive the word of God and that takes preparation. And oftentimes I think that we lack that. We just kind of come to church, kind of it's almost kind of get into a routine and, and do those things because you know, that's just kind of what we're supposed to do on Sunday morning. But again, we come with a, with a, again, with a prepared heart. Remember Jesus talked about four types of soil in, in the parable of the sower uh, in Mark's gospel. Uh, it's the one that I like to read uh, about that. He talked about the four types of soil. One was the rocky uh, soil. That was kind of the, the soil that he, not, not rocky, I'm sorry, it was the pathway. It would be like a, a, a path um, that people are walking on, trampling on. There's very, very little possibility that uh, seeds are gonna, get in and germinate. In fact, in that seed, he says that it represents the seed that's sown on a hard heart that the, the enemy comes when the seed is sown, the birds of the air, which represents Satan comes and takes away that word. So it never has an opportunity to, to get in the ground and to germinate. Then the next ground was rocky ground. And then that seed, uh, you know, you, you can imagine in rocks and stuff where there's a lot of rocks, there's some dirt that blows in there. So seed that gets cast in there, it can actually, if it can get buried a little bit, it will actually germinate and begin to the flower or the, or the, the blade can begin to grow up. But the Bible says because it didn't get any moisture, in other words, it didn't get any water, then the seed, it never produced anything. And the goal of seed is to produce fruit. The seed that's printed in our heart from the word of God is to produce fruit with that. that. And again, if that never gets watered and how that represents, if we hear the word, you get the word this morning and it's sown into your heart, but you never give it any other thought, you're not watering that seed. Right. Amen? Amen? And then the third type of soil was soil that was called the uh, thorny ground. 
And it was the seed that grew and it germinated and it started to grow. The blades came up, but because of the, the thorns, it choked it out. And Jesus says, that describes those thorns as the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the pursuit of other things. And that's, I'm telling you, that's where I believe that a lot of the church today is, is just we're so busy and, you know, husbands are working, wives are working, kids are involved in this and that. We're doing 90 miles an hour and then we, we come to church, but it's just the, the cares of this life. And the pursuit of other things choke out the word. And though it began and the blades came up, it never produced any fruit. And then, of course, Jesus says there's that third, the fourth soil is the, the good soil. And he said that soil, some produce some 30 fold, some 60 fold and some 100 fold. And what determined that? What determined those that, that produced 30, 60? I think, again, it was the soil. It was the water. It was the moisture. Giving more thought, more, more fertilizer. Keep adding on to that. Adding on to it. Amen? Amen. So it's important, again, that we have our, our soil ready when we, come, when we come to church. So let's pray today as we get into the Word. Father, thank you. Father, for your Word today. I thank you for an opportunity to sow your Word today into the hearts of these people. God, prepare our hearts today. Prepare our ears and our hearts to receive the things that you've, you've got for us this day. Lord, this didn't surprise you that in every, anyone or anyone walked into this place today. God, you knew they would be here. You knew this word was going to be shared. So, Father, again, we thank you. Thank you for opening our hearts today to receive your word. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you that, God, because of the anointing that's on your word, every addiction, every bondage, every stronghold is broken off of our lives in Jesus' name because of you and because of your word. If you agreed with that, would you give me a big hearty amen? Amen. amen. Praise God. So we're talking about, we're talking about honor. And uh, here's the definition. Again, I'm giving you this each week just to kind of start off with. Uh, honor means this. It means to esteem at the highest level. To esteem at the highest level. The more weight, the more that we esteem, the more weight we ascribe to something. And when you honor something or someone, it's not enough that you just have an honorable thought. You must, you must give action. There must be something that you do with, with that thought. It's, again, it's not enough just to have that honorable thought. Honor requires an outward expression. Something must come along with that. And that's what we're going to look today at together is, is one of those things that comes along with honor. If it's, again, if it's true honor. We looked last week uh, at this and we said that why is honor? Why is it such a big deal? We looked at the importance of honor. And I said that everything that Jesus did, everything that, that, that uh, the Holy Spirit did, everything that God does, it's laced, it's baked, it's seethed with honor, 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 everything he did. We saw the story about the, the wayward son, the Bible, uh, some people's, the Bible is labeled the prodigal son. And at least one of the reasons I believe that Jesus brought that word, brought that story, I think he was correcting some wrong teaching about God the Father, how, he, how when someone sins that he, he, he comes with judgment and with anger. And that's not how he comes. He, he shows this, this son that, that left and dishonored his family, dishonored his father and left and, and he came back. And it says that the, 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 the father honored the son. And when he saw the son a long way off, he saw him, he recognized that son's walk. You know, parents, they know their kids. They know their little walk. They know their little gallop or whatever it is. He noticed that man. The Bible says that he leaped off that, he ran to his son. Before his son said one word, he grabbed him, he embraced him, and he kissed him. He was honoring his son. Again, before the son repented and came back. Listen to this statement. This is a big statement. I got a big star on this in my notes. I want to emphasize this. This is important. In the kingdom of God, Honor is the key that releases all the fullness of the kingdom in your life. Let me say that again. Honor is the key that releases the fullness of the kingdom of God in your life. Honor is the key to release the fullness of the kingdom in your life. Amen? Listen, we need to grasp this, that the kingdom of God is not just some, some estate. It's just not some place that, that people go when they die. That certainly there is to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. There already is a place at the throne of God. There's already a place with, with mansions. There's already a place that Jesus has prepared. But the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is more, more than that. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 17. Verse 21, he says, people will say, he's talking to the Pharisees here. This is out of the New Century Version. He says, people will say, look, here he, here he is, or here it is, or there it is, because God's kingdom is within you. Now, I don't, I don't agree with that, that, uh, that translation that much. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. 
17, 21. Because listen again, Jesus was grilled. This is out of the Message Bible. Jesus was grilled by the Pharisees on when the kingdom of God would come. And answer, the kingdom of God doesn't come by counting days and calendars, nor when someone says, look here or look there, it is. And why? Because the kingdom of God is already among you. And I think that's more of an accurate translation, even though the, the Message Bible is not your, your most accurate translation. It kind of flowers it up. But there it's more accurate. Because again, who is he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees who the kingdom of God was not within them. But it was among them. It was around them. It was in people. It was in his disciples. The kingdom of God, again, is within us. And it's important for us to understand that. In the Gospels, uh, in, just in the book of Matthew alone, 10 times, 10 times Jesus is talking and he's telling parables. And if you remember what a parable is, a parable is a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. And oftentimes he would begin it by saying this, and the kingdom of heaven is likened to. And 10 times, 10 times in the book of Matthew, he said that. For example, let me give you Matthew's, uh, 20, Matthew 13, 24, a man sowed a seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed a seed into the field. A man is like a, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like hidden treasure. It's like the pearl of great price. It's like a net that's thrown into the sea. And so we live by these principles. We live by these kingdom principles of the kingdom of God. That's why the kingdom of God, again, is within us. So let me say this again because this is important. Honor is the key. Honor is the key, and this is why it's so important, friends, that we live a life of honor. It's the key to all the fullness of the kingdom of God in our life. Remember in Jesus' hometown, we looked at this last week. Remember there, it says, that, and there he could do no mighty works. Say that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them of a few minor things. Remember, it doesn't say that he, he would not. It says he could not. And why couldn't he? Because it's sad because in the, in the surrounding uh, villages and surrounding cities, uh, he, Jesus did amazing, amazing things, healings and miracles where he healed multitudes of people. But there in his own hometown, the pre- people that he probably knew the best, probably knew their families, knew what they were going through, knew what needs they had. <clears throat> and, the, and the ability to meet those needs was there. But the Bible says that they scoffed at him. They were offended at him. This is just Jesus. Our kids went to school with him. Who does he think he is? Where did he get all this authority? Who does, who does he think he is to call people out? Even though he had the goods, they were still, they didn't receive anything again because they dishonored him. <clears throat> How do we get to this place? How do we get to this, this estate, this place called heaven when we die? It's by honoring what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. By honoring what he did for us on the cross. When we do that, when we honor that, God gives us faith. Yes, he honors us and gives us faith as a free gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. God gives us. He honors us. When we honor what Jesus Christ did, God gives us the faith to receive the salvation. Listen, God may be setting you up. He may be setting you up uh, to be a blessing to someone. He's setting you up to be a blessing to someone. And then guess what? You get blessed too. When we bless others, don't you get blessed? It does. Listen, God can be prompting you maybe to step out in, in, in a spiritual gift. Maybe he's prompting you with a, 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 one of the spiritual gifts of a, a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or the discerning of spirits or miracles or gifts of healings or tongues or interpretation of tongues or prophecy. God could be prompting you to step out in one of those things. But ultimately, you have a choice to obey God in that or not when he gives us, when he prompts us to do those things. Maybe God's leading you to step out to receive something that he has for you. I say that again, maybe God's prompting you to step out and receive something for you. Maybe that there's a need in your life. Maybe you have a certain need in your life. <clears throat> in um, uh, Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 10, listen to this, Mark chapter 10, there's a man, there's a blind man by the name, anybody know what the, the blind man's name was? They call him blind Bartimaeus, thank you, you theologians. Blind Bartimaeus, and uh, listen what he says. It says in verse 47, this is Mark chapter 10, verse 47 out of the New Living Translation. And there was, uh, it says, when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus! And again, he didn't just go, Jesus, Jesus. No, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And his close friends around him said, shut up. He must have had a, just an annoying voice or something. You ever been around somebody that has an annoying voice? It must have been, sounded like a foghorn going off or something. Just shut up. 
And it says, look at what it says. It says, he shouted all the more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, how could he not hear him? How could he not hear him? He stopped and he said, tell him to come. Now all those good friends that were just hollering at him, telling him to shut, shut up. They were saying, hey, buddy, come on. Jesus is calling you. Now they're his friend. So they said, man, cheer up. Come on. He's calling you. So Bartimaeus, look at this. He threw aside his coat. He threw off that old beggar's robe. He jumped up and he came to Jesus. Now, I'm not exactly sure how he came to Jesus. He was blind. And I think it is interesting that Jesus told, said, tell him to come over here rather than Jesus going over there. <clears throat> I don't know what that's all about. But Jesus told him to come and he threw that up and he came again. I don't know how he got there. He probably bumped into somebody, probably stepped on their toe and they probably yelled at him again and stuff. But he got there to where Jesus was. He was being obedient to that word, come, tell him to come. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him and he said, my rabbi, honor, my rabbi, my teacher, my master. He said, I want to see He said, Master, he said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has healed you. Boy, I love that. Well, we could go off on that just a little bit right there. And Jesus didn't say, because you came to the right person, because you came to the Son of God, because you came and I am full of the anointing, I have healed you. He didn't. He said, your faith. Our faith plays a huge part in us receiving from God. Go, your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see. And he followed Jesus down the road. Another big star in my notes here. Obedience is a sign of honor. Obedience is a sign of honor. Remember, honor is not just a matter of the heart. There must be an outward expression. And the outward expression that we're talking about today is an act of obedience. That shows honor. Blind Bartimaeus was showing honor. Now we call him seeing Bartimaeus. But he showed honor by obeying that. Obedience... When we obey, it reveals honor. It reveals honor. Just like when when we speak in tongues, it reveals the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hello? Those of you that are filled, the Holy Spirit said, yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah. There's a lot of us, man, there's a lot of us that want God to do something for us. Is that right? We want God to do something for us. Even God do something in us. But here's here's a question. Here's a question worth pondering today. I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I willing to honor God's instructions? Am I willing to honor God's instructions? And let me add this to this by, as evidenced by obeying and being obedient to what he's telling me to do. We want God to do something in our life, but am I willing to obey? Am I willing to honor God? And if you're here and you say no to that, I'm not willing to honor God. Well, that's that. (laughs) But if you are here and you're saying, yes, I'm willing to obey when God tells me something, here's a follow-up question for that. This is a great one. How long am I willing to honor God? How long am I willing to be obedient when God tells me to do something? How about all day? Could you do it all day? If God told you he was leading you to do something, said he was going to do something, and you said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And God says, if you do it, I'm going to bless you. And you said, God, I'm going to do it. How long could you? Could you do it 24 hours? How about, how, about, how about a week? Could you do it a week? How about, how, about, how about a month? Could you be obedient to God and not see the, what God told you to do was going to happen and not see that, but you keep doing it? Could you, could you do it for a month? How about Noah? For 75 years, God told him, build a boat because it's going to rain. And Noah was obedient. He honored God and he built that boat. And you know he was faced under all kind of harassment. People telling him what an idiot he was and how stupid. They mocked him. They made fun of him. But he was obedient to do for 75 years. Joshua is another good one. The one that took over from from Moses, the leader that received the baton for 40 years. He walked with those sniveling, rebellious, murmuring people. For 40 years, honoring that God was going to give them the land of Canaan for 40 years. How long were we willing to be obedient to follow God? So let's answer this morning. Let's answer this question this morning. How do I begin to be obedient? How do I begin to to live a life of honor? And maybe you're here today and and you're living a life of honor and and that's great. And this will just be confirmation for you. But if you're someone and you're saying, you know what, I I really want to, I really feel like that I'm kind of lacking in that area and I want to live a life of honor. How do I begin? How do I get my name on the honor roll? 
Listen, when we talk about the kingdom, when we talk about the kingdom of heaven um, or the kingdom within us, a kingdom, a kingdom is the domain of a king. The kingdom is a domain of the king and it reflects the characteristics of that king. If the king is evil, then the, there's gonna be an evil, there's gonna be evil will be probably in that kingdom. If there's love, then there's probably love. In our king, with our king, he is a king of honor. There's honor in his kingdom. So when asking how do we begin to live a life of honor or how, how, can, we gain, how can we gain more of the characteristics? How do we gain more of the characteristics of our king? The more time you spend with him, the more time you spend with him, the more like him that you will become. I love this verse in Ephesians. This won't be up on your screen, up on the screen here, but let me just read this. But it says in Ephesians chapter five, verse one, be ye therefore imitators of God. Therefore, be imitators of God. You remember, I've told you this before. Whenever we see something in the scripture that says, therefore, what do we need to do? We need to stop and see what it's there for. It's carrying on a thought. Let's see what it's there for. So remember, the Bible is not written in chapter and verse. The translators added that later so that we could find things. I'm glad that they did, aren't you? So let's go back into the previous chapter, the end of the previous chapter, and see what, what, what Paul is saying here. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now he comes into chapter five. Again, same thought thing. Translators just added this. Therefore, because what we just said, be imitators of God as beloved children. Do you know how natural it is for children to, to, uh, to uh, imitate their fathers? and little girls to imitate their mothers. As beloved children, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice for God. So the more time that we spend with our father in reading the word and studying and in worshiping him and giving him of our time, our talent and our treasures, we become more like the king in our kingdom, in the kingdom of God there. Jesus' followers came up one day and they asked him, they said, you know, master, teach us to pray. And they were referring to John the Baptist as John taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus didn't say, oh, you'll get it. You know, just kind of hang around me and just watch me. He said, all right, here's how you pray. So he taught them how to pray. And I don't believe that Jesus just gave this, you know, this little prayer, this little 30 second prayer and said, that's your, that's your, your encompasses your prayer. You pray that daily and you're good to go. But I believe that he was giving six demarcations. Six areas to, to praise. And I want you to notice particularly how this prayer that he taught them to pray, how it starts and how it ends. Notice first that it didn't start this way. Our problems here on earth. That's not what we say. No, it's our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Now, we don't use that word hallowed very much today, but that word means holy. What he's talking about is give honor to who God is, that he is, our, he is our peace, he is Jehovah Shalom, he is our righteousness, he is Jehovah Makedish, he is, he is Jehovah Sidkenu, he is the Lord our, our righteousness, he is the Lord uh, our Nissi, our Lord our banner, he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is our provider, he is our healer, he is Jehovah Rapha, he is all of these things and we're honoring him, we're blessing him. Oh, our Father who art in heaven, bless it who you are. And that's the first demarcation. The second one is, is, is give us, is he, is he, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. This is number two. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the third demarcation. We're thanking him that he gives us our daily needs. Forgive us of our debts. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And number six is for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice it started with honor and it ends with ad adoration. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. All adoration, honor and adoration there. Now listen to this, a life of honor has a lot to do with your philosophy of life. Let me say that again. Living a life of honor has a lot to do with your philosophy of life and that determines your worldview. In other words, your worldview your worldview, how you see, how you see the world. Everyone, whether you realize it or not, you have a philosophy. Everybody has a philosophy. Everybody has a philosophy. Simply put, listen to this, philosophy is simply, it's simply a basic set of ideas, beliefs, and values that you live your life by. You live your life by your life philosophy. And most of us, 
our philosophy in life comes from our parents. And then as we grow, then, they, then other people begin to have input into our philosophy of life, like school teachers and coaches and professors in college. They begin to in, in, uh, in, start to infect, that might be a better word, effect or infect our philosophy in life. Every piece of, listen, every piece of information and situation that you face is filtered through your life philosophy. Did you know that? Let me say that again. Every piece of information, every situation that you face is filtered through your philosophy. And in reality, in reality, your life philosophy predetermines your response to situations that you encounter. Did you ever think about your life philosophy, whatever it is, it already, it's predetermined. Whatever you're about to face, it's already how you're going to respond to it. If people know your philosophy of life, they've been around you long enough, they know how how you're thinking, they know how you're going to react to it because we react, we see things and we react by our, our life philosophy. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Uh, here, here, here's a, a, an easy, a very simple uh, I- illustration. I am a simple man, and so I'm going to make this simple. Optimism and pessimism. Being an optimist or a pessimist. A pessimist looks forward to the future and expects the worst. I mean, let me say that again. A pessimist looks towards the future and expects the worst, while an optimist looks towards the future and expects the best. An optimist always sees the best. Now, before I came out here today, I was in my office and Riley came up there and I asked her, I said, Riley, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And she says, well, I think I'm a lot like you. And I said, hmm. Knowing that she's a little bit pessimist sometimes. I said, she says, I'm a lot like you. And I looked at her and she said, and grandma. Now I knew when she said that where we were going. Now my mom was a godly woman. She loved God. And if you were in trouble, she'd encourage you. But for herself and stuff like this, you know, there's a trash can turned over in the road across from the medical place. Oh, somebody needs to pick that trash can up because some kid's going to ride by on his bicycle because there's probably hypodermic needles in there that have AIDS patients and they're going to fall and get stuck and they're going to get AIDS. That's my mom. And that's one, that's one example. So when Riley said that, I said, Riley, I am not a pessimist. She said, oh, dad. And I just, I just, there's no way. Absolutely not. You're wrong. So while we were worshiping, I slipped over and I asked Paula something. I said, Paula, am I a pessimist or an optimist? She's a pessimist. <laughs> I, I am literally shocked. I felt like that I'm an optimist. So you know what I did when we were singing the rest of those songs? I was, God, forgive me. God, help me to change. If my kids see me and my wife sees me, I'm not even going to ask you what you guys say. I'm ruined for the day already. But seriously, I need to do some changing. Hello? When you get home, or maybe at lunch today, ask your spouse. Ask, oh, ask your kids. Ask her. Ask her. Is grandma an optimist or a pessimist? Not right now. I don't want to hear her scream. Listen. An optimist and a pessimist could see, key, could see the exact same situation and they'd have totally different reactions to it because they're see different. That's why, Paul, that's why Paul told the church at Colossae, that's the Colossian church, that's why he told them in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, he said, see to it. The, uh, that's the, uh, the NIV, the New King James Version says, beware. It's, from, it's a... It's a it's two English words, beware, but it's one, ink, what's one, Hebrew, uh, one uh, Greek word. And it, what it means is be at war. Beware, beware lest anyone cheat you. But it says in the NIV, see to it that no one takes you captives through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than, than that of Christ or rather than the kingdom of God. Listen, Christians, Christians today are facing, I believe, some of the greatest attacks on their Christian values than any time in history. Yeah. And you go, oh, well, well, Pastor, that covers a lot of stuff. No, 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 no. You have to understand, because of this, because we live in the information age of TV and radio and cell phones continuously being bombarded with negative philosophies and the world's, uh, the world's philosophies, we hear it every day, every day through all of these different, different venues, far more than any generation that has ever lived. We get it more because we live in this information age. 
Paul said to the church at Kala, I say again, be at war. Beware of these things. I think where a lot of Christians miss it is, is they're on their guard against vain deceit from the devil. They're guarding against any vain deceit from the devil, but where, they're, but where they're getting in trouble is they'll swallow the deceit whole from a messenger of his. And I'm not talking some demon messenger. I'm talking some Bible-toting Christians who will feed them stuff that's not true. Beware. That's Paul's talking about these false teachers that are going around. It's just not the devil we got to worry about. It's other people. <laughs> You think about, think about Adam and Eve. How did, how did Satan get them, how did he get them to, to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? How did they get him to, to dishonor God by being uh, rebellious? How did he do that? Did he, he didn't get them down on the ground and twist their leg behind their neck and shove the apple in their mouth and said, eat this. He didn't do it. No, he came against them with words, with thoughts and suggestions. And he corrupted their way of thinking. Honoring God and being obedient to him has much to do with our biblical worldview, our kingdom worldview. And having a biblical worldview should be the determining factor. That should be the determining factor of our philosophy of life. We should see the world through the kingdom eyes, through the kingdom lens. What would Jesus do? That should be a part of the philosophy of our life. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? How would Jesus react? Whew, if we could just stop long enough before we react or say something and just think, how would he do this? What would he say in this situation? What would he post on Facebook? <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to say something and, and I'm not going to point anybody out. But you know what? I was really impressed with during the week one of us, we was talk, talking about that, about things that you're saying and pe things that you're posting on Facebook, they're not honoring to people. Even if they have a different belief or a different line or a different political persuasion than you or stuff, but we say things and they're hurtful. And you know what they did? They said, I'm gonna step away from Facebook for a while because they knew they were having a hard time not saying what was on their mind and posting it. But they stepped away from it. They saw that. Man, good for them. Good for you, you're here today. So let me close with this. I want to close with this. God is always speaking. It's about another 15 minutes, but I'm closing. <laughs> God is always speaking. Every Sunday, God's speaking. Every Sunday in this church, every Sunday in churches, God is speaking. Every time you pick up the Bible, God is speaking. Every time he's speaking, he's speaking. When you pick up the Bible, that's the, that's the, the, the written word of God. That's the logos. But God also speaks the rhema the spoken word of God. You'll hear, I feel like the spirit of the Lord told me this. That's him speaking to you. He's speaking to you. Sometimes he can be speaking so clear to you, it's almost as though he was audible. It's almost like you want to say to somebody, did you hear that? That's the, but he's always speaking. And let me tell you this, just as a side note, his rhema, his spoken word will always line up with his logos. God will never go outside of the logos. He'll no, never go outside of his written word and tell you something. It will always line up in that. You can always confirm it in the word of God. He's always speaking to us. But we must determine when we hear, we must determine when we hear it, are we going to be obedient to it? Here's the thing, not thing, here's the thing. Your response. Your response. God's always speaking. What's going to be your response? What's going to be your response? People sitting in the same church can hear the same message and have wildly different reactions. Wildly different reactions. Wildly different. Wildly different experiences because one honors the word and one doesn't honor the word. Your life is going to be different when you honor God's word and when you don't honor God's word. That's just, that's just a fact. Listen, a word, a word from God may be that he wants to heal somebody. Heal somebody of a, of a back problem or a knee problem or maybe they, they've been diagnosed with, with heart, heart trouble or heart disease. And any person who has those conditions hears that thing. Listen, they can, they can react in different ways. Number one, they can be skeptical. They can sit there wondering, well, is the word for them or not? 
Well, if it's, you know, if, if, if the word from whoever's ministering, if they say, there's somebody here today, your name is Bob, and you've got back troubles. The Lord's healing you right now. Or if you'll come up, the Lord will heal you. We want to lay hands on you. He's speaking to Bob. Someone today, is there anybody today that has back problems? Or anybody today that you've been diagnosed with heart disease? That's anybody. How many of you know I'm a somebody, I'm an anybody, if that's me, if I've got the back problem, if I've got the knee, the heart, or whatever. Don't sit and wonder. Don't let the enemy talk you out. Get in on it. I'll take that. God, I'll take that. I receive that. I receive it. You know, a pastor can de- declare the word of God to you, but how you respond to it. You know, there's a great story in the, in the, book, of, uh, in the book of John uh, about a nobleman's son. And he had a son that was sick and he was ready to die. And he came to ask Jesus to, to heal his son. And Jesus replied to him, he says, your son will live. And now, and, and the man took Jesus at his word and departed. He just came and told him, my son's dying, come. And maybe he had heard, maybe he had heard about Jairus and how he went to Jesus and had Jesus come to his house. And he healed his little daughter. And the little woman with the issue of blood touched him on the way there and she was healed. He heard about these things. Maybe he heard about the centurion servant and asked Jesus to come to his house. But Jesus, all he said to him, he told him, he says, ah, your son live. And the man took him at his word and departed. And watch this, verse 51 says, and while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as the time that his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that was the exact time that Jesus said to him, your son will live. So he and all his household believed. And we don't know this, but what would have happened if the man had stood there? No, I need you to come to my house. Jesus said, go, I told you, your son is, he he is well, he'll live. No, you went to Jairus' house. Why don't you? We don't know, but maybe he would have missed out. But he took Jesus, he honored him, he honored the word. He was obedient to do what God told him to do. Listen, I'm not saying that you take every prophetic word that someone says to you, you take it to the bank. A prophetic word, the Bible says that the sons of God, the sons, and that would be the daughters of God as well, we're led by our spirits. We're not led by the prophets like they were in the Old Testament. But the prophets today, they can lead, but what mostly their words should be confirming. If somebody came and and, and said to me when I was in Bible college and says, you're going to go to China and be a missionary. I wouldn't have gone and studied the Chinese language and did all these things. You know what I've done? I would have put it up. Thank you. Thank you for that word. And I would have put it on the shelf and I would have seen if maybe, maybe five years, 10 years, maybe 20 years, all of a sudden it came, all of a sudden I began to develop a thing for China. And now, now I remember that word. Just put it on the shelf. Don't go try to make it happen. Honest to goodness, truth has happened. This husband and wife, this guy was giving words. He's praying over everybody. And he told this one lady, he said, the Lord has called you. He's called you to Indonesia. Indonesia, you're going to Indonesia. The next person in line was a man. You're going, you're going to China. You're going to China. She said, well, that was my husband. I mean, that was my wife that was going to Indonesia. He said, wait a minute, come here, come back, come back, come here, come here, come here. Yes, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Indochina, Indochina, Indochina. You know, I mean, you don't take every word and just go do it. Make sure it bears witness with you. Remember, honor, honor isn't just thinking in agreement, it's acting in agreement. How many of you have ever felt an impression for God to go up and tell somebody that God loves them? Don't raise your hands. How many of you, have, most of us have felt that just, just go up and tell them, just tell them that I love them. And how many of us have reasoned that that's my flesh? Oh, please. Your flesh? Or that's the devil just trying to embarrass me. The devil wants you to go tell somebody that God loves them. Man, I wish that we could, be, we could be as bold as Mary. Mary and Martha, when Jesus was at Lazarus' house, and Mary comes in with this, this jar of expensive perfume. She could care less what people thought of her. She could care less. In fact, they were, she's doing all this stuff. And she did, and she washed his feet, and she dried it with her hair. Dried his feet with her hair. Man, she was bold. She changed the atmosphere of that room by her obedience. Obedience is a sign of honor. Obedience is a sign of honor. When God tells you to do something, it's not enough to give him lip service. Yes, Lord, you're, I'll do that. But then we never get around to it. True honor always has an expression, an outward expression. 
Maybe God's telling you to do something as simple as write somebody a card, send somebody a text. Just tell them that I love them. Tell them I care about them. Just let them know that somebody loves them. Maybe it's paying for their meal. Maybe it's walking over and telling the waitress, hey, give me their check. Maybe it's buying them a t-shirt out in the, out in the foyer. Maybe it's just something as simple as just obeying what God tells you to do. You know, so many times, so many times we want God to do things in our life. We look at somebody else and we say, God, you always use them. God, they, you, you're always speaking to them. You're always doing great things through them. Do things through me. And we won't even do something as simple as go up and tell somebody that the Spirit of God said, go tell them that I love them. They need to hear that for a reason or else the Spirit of God wouldn't tell you to go do it. Obey. And then when we obey in the small things, then God will bless us and give us larger things to do. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we bless you today. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your honor. Thank you for honor. Thank you that you demonstrate it to us. We thank you, God, today for your word. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It's already a done deal. Oh, God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to be obedient. Oh, Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for simple things like a, a daughter telling me that I'm a pessimist and a wife telling me that, yeah, she was right. God, I, that's, a, that's an area I joke about it, but God, it's an area that I want to change. I don't want to be seen that way. I don't want to be seen that way by you. So Father, help us. Holy Spirit, show us. Send people, send labors across our path. People that we love, that we'll listen to. When we ask them, they'll tell us the truth about things. Oh God, we bless you. God, I want to honor you in what I say. I want to honor you in how I think. I worship you today. I bless you. Let's all stand.